Hello, good evening. I'm Leah White, Assistant Director at Wilmette Public Library. Welcome to our One Book Everyone Reads signature event, featuring Dawn Turner in conversation with Alex Kotlowitz to discuss her memoir, Three Girls from Bronzeville, a uniquely American memoir of race, fate, and sisterhood. Before I introduce our guest, a little housekeeping to let you know how things are going to go tonight. Uh, tonight's program will last about an hour, which will conclude with questions from you, the audience. You can submit your questions using the Q&A function in your Zoom window. Librarians Barbara Goodman and Amy Barrow will be leading those questions. Um, every participant will be muted and your cameras will be off. I saw we had a question about that. Your cameras are off, so um, you can see us, but we cannot see you. Um, next, if you haven't read Three Girls from Bronzeville, please do. Uh, contact us uh, at Wilmette Public Route Library. We can get you a copy. You can contact your local library. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy, you can buy one from the bookstall, who we are partnering with for tonight, and they have signed copies of the book that are available for purchase. Following tonight's event, you will receive an email from us uh, with a link to more information about the One Book series and more information about Three Girls from Bronzeville. There will also be a link to a survey um, because of course there will be. We would love to hear from you and get some feedback about how tonight's program is, uh, about how it goes. Okay, on to the main event. Uh, we are thrilled to welcome Don Turner, author of this year's one book selection, Three Girls from Bronzeville to the Wilmette Community. Ms. Turner is an award-winning journalist and novelist, a former columnist and reporter for the Chicago Tribune. She spent a decade and a half writing about race, politics, and people whose stories are often dismissed or ignored. Ms. Turner, who served as a 2017 and 2018 juror for the Pulitzer Prize in Commentary, has written commentary for the Washington Post, PBS NewsHour, CBS Sunday Morning News Show, NPR's Morning Edition, The Chicago Tonight Show, and elsewhere. She has covered national presidential conventions as well as Barack Obama's 2008 presidential election and inauguration. Ms. Turner is also the author of two novels, Only Twice I've Wished for Heaven and An Eighth of August. In 2018, she established the Don M. Turner and Kim B. Turner Endowed Scholarship in Media at her alma mater at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Ms. Turner will be in conversation with journalist and writer Alex Kotlowitz. For more than 40 years, he has been telling stories from the heart of America. He is the author of four books, including the national bestseller, There Are No Children Here, which the New York Public Library selected as one of the 150 most important books of the 20th century. Kotlowitz's work has appeared in numerous publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and On This American Life. And with that, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Don Turner and Alex Kotlowitz. Thank you so very much. Such Thanks, a Leah. That was thank you, Dawn. It's so great to be here with you. Oh my goodness, it's my honor. <laughs> I'm so excited, Alex. <laughs> got so many questions. I don't even sure where to begin. So first of all, I've got to say um, that I just, I mean, I just love this book. And one of the things I love about it is how open-hearted and honest and true it is, which you can't say about most memoirs. And so at some point, I do want to talk to you about writing a memoir, uh, especially as a journalist, because I thought you, it, um, um, but I really love what Publishers Weekly wrote about this book. You know, it said it's, it's by turns beautiful, tragic, and inspiring. And I think that kind of about sums it up. It, it's just, um, so I'm thrilled that Wilmette has chosen it as this one, one, one book uh, read. So I, you know, I thought the place to begin, I thought about, this I wanted obviously want to talk about Deborah and Kim and others in your orbit, but I actually want to begin by talking about I think one of the most important characters in the book, and that's the sense of place, Bronzeville. And there are two things you write at the beginning of the book that I just want to read because I'd love for you to sort of reflect on both of these. You write at the very beginning, you write to understand Deborah, Kim, and me. And Deborah was your best friend, and Kim was your younger sister. 
To understand what will happen to us, you have to know the place that has begun to shape us. And you then write a little bit later, which I thought was really provocative. The country will think it knows everything about our neighborhood and us, but it won't. It can't possibly know. So do you want to talk a little bit about this sense of place? Because it feels so essential to this story. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I want to thank you again for, for speaking with me. And thank you so much to, to the Wilmette Public Library for choosing um, three girls. I'm just so honored. Um, but place is hugely important um, in this story and in most of our stories, uh, because we are shaped by our surroundings. And for Deborah, my best friend, and Kim, my sister, um, we make the, up the three girls, um, it was our playground. And this was a place where, um, it, for my family, my great grandparents arrived in Chicago as part of the Great Migration in 1916. My grandmother was three years old, and they arrived in Chicago, in Bronzeville, what would become Bronzeville, um, escaping the ravages of the Jim Crow South. And they believed, as many of the, the migrants believed, that um, Chicago or any place up north was the promised land, or at least a place where they could have some aspect of the American dream that was not as perverted as it had been in the South. And so they arrive in this place, and I mean, in, in, in the beginning, it is. It's something new and it's shiny, but because, I mean, there were so, first of all, the city. Um, commanded uh, the, its new residents to a narrow strip of land on the near south side called the Black Belt. And as that, as more people uh, arrived in Chicago and that area began to expand, it pushed eastward. And you had so many of the, the, the properties were, um, they had fallen on disrepair and not solely because you had so many people pushed into um, these places, but because landlords did not keep them up. And, and because they did try to get as much money as they possibly can by shoving all of these people into these properties. But the, the area was also in part um, abandoned by the city. So when Deborah Kim and I are, and well, my, my grandmother would say, you know, we, we as black folks, we did what, um, what we've always done. We took a bunch of scraps and stitched together a world. Um, and so 50 years later, when my, I'm born, my sister, and, and when we we're coming of age, about 60 years later, in the same community, it has, it, it's still dealing with some of the, 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 the institutional issues that, that happens to a lot of um, communities of color, where you in Chicago, we had housing covenants that restricted where black people could live. You had redlining that, 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 that served as, a, um, that did this, served in service of that, that was in service of that restrictions. And, and so, but, and yet, we, Deborah Kim and I were growing up in the Theodore K. Lawless Gardens apartment, and it was a place named after a prominent Black dermatologist, Dr. Theodore K. Lawless. And it was a place where, I mean, the, the, the elevators, um, stainless, shield, stainless steel, shiny, um, the, the, the lawns always perfectly manicured, the um, playgrounds colorful and vibrant. And it was this, um, as part of the, the, the promise, this first generation after the civil rights movement, I mean, this was part of our promise to live in this pristine area. However, it was right across the street from a public housing project. And that was um, fully abandoned and had begun to deteriorate. And so Lawless Gardens, what we did, what management did on our side of the street was build this fence um, it became, in essence, a gated community. Build the fence around. Built the fence around Lawless Gardens. So, um, so, so that was. And yet, this was our playground. I mean, we as girls, we didn't let the fence stop us from, you know, uh, um, just traversing the community and understanding uh, its bounty. We didn't uh, fully appreciate. The history, you had um, uh, Richard Wright who had lived there, Ida B. Wells, the famous um, the journalist and anti-lynching activist who had, had lived there, lived a half a block from where I was growing up. Gwendolyn Brooks, um, I still bow at her writing 
alter. Um, she lived there in Bronzeville. Uh, Dr. Daniel Hill Williams, the first uh, heart surgeon, not just the first black heart surgeon, but the first heart surgeon to complete the first successful heart surgery, lived there in Bronzeville. Um, it is, you know, people know about Harlem, but not as many people really appreciate the 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 impact um, that 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 Bronzeville had on uh, not just the city, not just our lives, but the country and beyond. You know, and when you write about, you know, how you people will think they know my journey because of where I'm from, it reminded me of Chimamanda Adichie's, you know, the danger of the single story, you know, the danger of thinking you know someone because of their circumstance or race or ethnicity. Right. And I felt like that line in some ways was kind of directed towards white readers. Like, you think you know me because I came from Bronzeville from the South Side of Chicago, but you don't know me and you don't know my sister and you don't know my best friend. And for me, it was really, it was just a really provocative way to begin the book um, because it said to me, you know, I think you're right. And so I just uh, sort of sat back at that point and sort of let you introduce me to Deborah and Kim. Well, one of the things that I find incredibly frustrating is when um, the south side of Chicago or the west side of Chicago, I mean, they're often painted with one brush. And the, both areas are, um, are incredibly diverse and they are not at all monolithic. And so, and, for, and there, and we think about what happens when you paint a swath, I mean, of, of a community with one brush, it, it affects the types of loans you get um, or may not get in terms to buy in terms of buying a home, it affects property values. I mean that aside, but it affects lives and life chances and whether some dreams are allowed to thrive and others just kind of wither. And and so 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 I think it's so important um, what, what we you know, in the media what we tend to do too often is we parachute into communities when something cataclysmic happens. And then we report on that, but then we don't really try to understand the dynamics behind that. And I know you get this because this is what you have written about for, for many, many years. Um, but just, and that's what I wanted to, in telling the story about Deborah, Kim and me, I wanted to talk about just the nuances because you will see three black girls and think that, 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 that you know who they are. You'll see, you'll see three black girls from the south side of Chicago and think you know who they are because we wanted, you know, our minds, we were wired to try to create all of these connections and stereotypes and all of that. And I wanted the story to be more than that, to be more, because it is, and everybody's story is. Um, yeah, one of the things I love about the book is in some ways the complexity of each of the characters. I mean, not only your Kim and Deborah, but your mother, your father. Um, so I want to, before we talk about, um, well, let me ask you this, I guess. So, and I, I, it's hard for me to know what, I, so when, you know, if this is a, I should say spoiler alert, but no, yeah. yeah, but your, you know, your sister um, meets a, a tragic and, and, and Deborah has her own struggles. Um, and so you emerge from this. And so I, I, my first question is, so, so what sort of led you to sort of go back and sort of think about writing about your journey and their, and their journey? Um, um, you know, without them, my story would be very different. So our lives are very much braided. Um, I met my sister in 1968 when I was three years old. My par our, our parents brought her home. And from the very beginning, she was a mystery to me. Stubborn, headstrong, I mean, just loud. Um, and I met Deborah in the second grade. And at that point, we were seven years old. And I would just stare at her because she was very different. She was so different for me. She was the prettiest girl in the, in the school. Um, but she always found her way to the principal's office and not because she went there on her own. Um, and, and we became best friends in the third grade. But it was a story. It, this story was something that I started to actually tell it. Um, we'll fast forward a little bit in 2000 when she is, um, she is on trial for murder. Right. And, and this I is start, your friend Deborah. This is Deborah. Yes, yeah. this is. So I start to tell the story then. 
And then I told a couple of times more in the pages of the Chicago Tribune. And so I'm thinking maybe because the, the, at the heart is when did we lose them? But them being my sister, my best friend. But in the beginning, my, the story that I wrote about um, was, was Deborah and me, our friendship. And it wasn't until 2010 when Westmore, the author Westmore published The Other Westmore, um, about two young black men in Baltimore with two very different faiths. Um, one will be a road scholar and the other one um, is in prison serving a life sentence without possibility of parole. And, and I, it wasn't until that book was pub published and I read it and I thought, well, maybe Deborah and I, maybe we have a story. Our story would be different because we're women, um, and, but we also, we, we've known each other for decades. And that was not the case with Westmore's story. And so when I started to put together a proposal for my agent at the time, um, my sister, true to form, leapt off the page and my agent said, well, this really isn't a story about two girls. It's a story about three girls. And, and just trying to, to tie those, weave those stories together um, was, was the, the, the challenge, but that is kind of the origin story. Um, and Don, when you sat down to, when you began, when you began the project, did you initially think to yourself, well, I'm just gonna sit down and write and I just from memory and... Uh... <laughs> oh my God. Um, I don't, I, I have a lot of letters from over the years, but you're absolutely right in that I did think it was something that, you know, I'm a journalist. I've done this before. I've told other people's stories before. And, and I, did, I, mean, I think that you have to be somewhat delusional to be able to, to write a memoir, <laughs> to think that, oh, you know, I, you know, beginning, middle, and end or whatever. Um, and so it was something that I thought was going to be, I mean, not easy, but I had no idea what I was in for because I had a lot of material. And, that, and, in, and, and part of that was um, court documents, um, hundreds and hundreds of pages from Deborah's case that I had to go through because memory, you know, is memory. And I wanted to make sure that I had the record correct. But one of the things I've heard you talk about too, which I find interesting is you actually went back and interviewed people. Yes. Also, yeah. It, um, I mean, you were out to sort of, I mean, you know, memory is not flawless. Um, and I think one of the, one of the, the challenges of memoir writing is I think often we want to write about ourselves in the best of lights. And so I just admire the fact that you went back and talked to all these other agents in your life. Yeah, because I really did want it to be as close to the truth as, as it could be. Um, but, and I have to say, I have to bring in my editor, Christine Pride in this. I mean, she's an amazing storyteller, editor, writer herself. Um, but so when you're ha tackling something that with so much material and you can go in so many different directions with the story, it's nice to have someone who kind of corrals you and, and, and says, it's who, who can direct you. And she, she was incredibly um, helpful and just integral. To, she, I, I always say that I, I, this is not a book that I could have written without her, her guidance. Were there things that, along the way that surprised you that you learned about others or things that surprised you that you learned about yourself? Um, in, initially, I was so focused on my sister's story and Deborah's story and making sure that I got it right, that I, so when I got back to my story, my part of it, um, I, I was like, uh, because there, there was, there were swaths of, 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 um, of chapters that did not have anything about my professional life in it, um, which is a huge part of my life. And, and I had to go back and, and, and do that. But in terms of, um, I, I learned a lot more about Kim, um, uh, people telling me how much she had helped them in, in ways modest and big. And, and which was really interesting to me because um, I, I always knew how she felt about me. And I mean, what a big heart she had, but I didn't know. I mean, they gave me like concrete examples about, her um, buying different things, like um, feeding uh, people on the street. Uh, because at her funeral, there were people who came from various uh, walks of life. And so, so to, and some of whom I had met, 
but to meet people um, who said that, oh, every day or every other day she would bring me a sandwich or and it was just, you know, it just really, it blew my mind. Um, or Deborah, when, when I learned, I talked to people who said just how much she had tried to get off of um, drugs, how much she had tried so hard, uh, in, including um, trying to get, she went, one time she saw a police officer who was in the middle of a, a traffic stop and she stopped the officer and said, um, I need you to arrest me because I, I need to, you know, I, I can't stop doing drugs by myself. But I mean, just the stories of people, stories of people, um, stories that people told of both of them. Um, and then there were stories that people reminded me that, uh, that I forgot. Like I, I forgot that my teacher, uh, our third grade teacher threw uh, a big party for me when I was going to get my tonsils taken out. <laughs> And, and just, but, but once the person reminded me that I, I completely remember, but that's the value of interviewing, um, interviewing people. Were there things that you learned about yourself along the way? Yeah, um, I, I learned that I'm really, really good at compartmentalizing. Uh, and when I said about being somewhat delusional, thinking that oh, I'll just write this, I'll write this memoir. Um, it, it was interesting because, you know, one of the ways we deal with pain is that we pack that stuff away and we push it to the farthest <laughs> of the closet or whatever. And then we try not to, to, to go back into it. But just this whole idea of going back, rereading diary entries, especially around the time when my sister died, um, rereading diary entries uh, around the time that, that I learned that Deborah uh, was in jail um, before her trial, uh, just, I, I, I just, you know, you, you don't, think about that stuff every day and so it was something that I had put away but have, having to revisit it for the story um, there there were times when I would write a, a sentence and literally have to walk a mile just to kind of walk it out walk whatever that was that that, that had seeped into my bones and my muscles yeah I, mean, I think about it early, actually early in the book is a very painful moment you write about um, about your dad, you know, yeah. to, um, when he tried to strangle your mother and, um, uh, and how difficult that must have been to revisit for you and also for your, for your mom. I mean, your mom just seems like an incredible, she like, seems, seems like a force of nature. Uh, I mean, there's a scene the next day when she and your grandmother and your aunt are just throwing, just going and just taking everything your dad's and there's a there's a great line I think your grandmother takes his toothbrush like a javelin and throws it into a plastic bag but um but that must have been that must have been really hard to write um and also to revisit not only for you but also to revisit with your mom yes it was incredibly difficult to write um th there are things that were very sensitive about Deborah that I was able to talk to her and just make sure that I had her permission to share. Um, and then there were things about my life and my sister's life. So my mother became my sister's proxy since my sister's no longer with us. Um, but there are things about my mother's life that I really wanted to get permission to share it. And when she said it was okay, then I, I, then I did. And I wanted to also um, handle it in a very, very delicate way. That there have been readers have asked me, um, did my mother have this big conversation about, you know, did, did she sit my sister and I down and sit uh, my sister and me down and 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 have a conversation about um, domestic violence or any of that? And back then, I mean, there was the conversation about my father having to leave, but I think it was more of that show don't tell and that um, no one ever has a right to touch you, even if, if it's one time. And if that happens, that becomes a deal breaker. And that was the lesson. Um, it was the nonverbal. I, I always say that, that they had the clean, cleanup crew who came the next day. And that was my, my, mo my grandmother and my aunt. And they moved my father out. But um, Alex, it was really important for me to also write about the discussion that I would have with my father. Um, a couple of decades later, um, and 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 my father, and so just to, to talk to him about this, uh, because I also didn't want my father, as an African American man, um, to be uh, to be a caricature, to be a stereotype. Um, I mean, you know, we did not have the daddy's little girl <laughs> type relationship, 
but my father was very present in our lives. Um, and it was a very complicated relationship. And that is not unfamiliar with, you know, all of us. We have very complicated relationships that we can't, we may, you know, for, with the people we love. And, and so that conversation, um, those, the, the few months that I spent with him interviewing him, because I couldn't do it as a daughter, I did it as a journalist. And the time that I spent with him talking about I mean, learning who he was and talking about that night, and which and that was the question that I saved for the very end, um, because you know that's what you do as a journalist. <laughs> if you have a combustible question, you don't want to start with it. And 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 so we had that conversation, and I wanted him to, you know, I mean, people talk about the women being so important in the story, and they are, but there were so many men in my life, so many black men who were. Um, just um, so critical to 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 shaping me in my life. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, it's clear. I mean, your dad, your dad, your husband, your, your the the, the yeah. dean of you of U of I. Um, so I'm curious with your dad. That must have been an incredibly emotional time as you sat down to interview. Uh, well, you know, I it was. I mean, I really in my head, I, I really saw myself as being a journalist. You um, really can compartmentalize. I, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but and it, but it, and it wasn't completely, um, you know, it wasn't completely sanitized because there were moments when, you know, when he he really embraced the stray cat. And, and so whenever the cat would jump into his lap and he would just caress the cat, I was just like, okay, well, <laughs> didn't know that was possible. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but so, so no, you're right. It, and then it wasn't until the very light, last um, meeting that I, I did get emotional because that was the, the moment when I had to ask him, why did he hurt my mom? Because that type of, I mean, you know, violence will um, penetrate your molecules and it mm -hmm. shapes who you are. And, 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 and I was happy that he did not say, well, it only happened one time, but he really did not know exactly what to say, but he did not say that. And I was so happy that, um, that I had that time with him. Right. Yeah, I mean, you're, you mentioned your mom too about not talking about this. If I remember right, it was the next day where you, where she, it's almost as if you're with her and it's almost as if it had never happened. In fact, you, I think you, you say you wonder whether you had dreamed it and then you saw the marks on her neck and realized yeah. how real it was. Yeah, your mom was remarkable. And um, I ju she just, this, she had a great line too about your sister when your sister was in adolescence and kind of filling out and uh, you write had a jiggly ass yeah. and a jiggly butt and your mom, I'm gonna get this right, but uh, she wrote, girl, you need to get some law and order about your ass. I love that line. Love that yes, line. my mother has a lot of those lines. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, as I'm writing a memoir, because um, I think about this a lot when I'm writing my stories, you know, your real, where your loyalty lies. Is it to the people whose stories you're telling or is it to your reader? Um, it's even more difficult, I think, as a memoirist, because you're talking about people who are very near and dear to your heart, like your mom. Did you, when you sat down to write, did you wrestle with that question of loyalty? Am I writing for my mom or my writing for my reader? Were there times when you found yourself pulling punches and then realizing I can't do this? Well, um, I wrestled with everything. And that's yeah. what I did not understand because I, when I write about um, other people, uh, whether it's for the Chicago Tribune or it was for them or wherever, I really, really want to get the story right. And I will go over it um, so many times and, and go back to the, the subject so many times uh, just to make sure it, that, that, it's, um, that it adheres to, I mean, that it's not just the spirit of what was said, but that clearly, I mean, that, that there are no uh, mistakes. And, and so I did, I wrestled with it all. I wrestled with um, how much of myself I wanted to reveal. Um, but I was more concerned about my sister and my best friend and my mother because it, this is not just my story. Right. And that is why I went to them. Um, I went to my mother, to Deborah, uh, so many times to go over uh, what was said. I talked to the judge who presided over her case um, because even though I had the court documents, I wanted to hear his voice. 
And what I was really interested, what was really interesting is that he did not remember her name, but he remembered her case because he said that her story was not typical of the people that he tip that he saw um, stand before him with drug in drug related cases because her family was I mean, her family members were so incredibly supportive. So he remembered her twenty something years later wow. um, because of that, and that just kind of speaks to the nature of um, I, I, well, first of all, her her family support. But also just, you know, how bruising this can be, I mean, addiction can be on families uh, when they just kind of, they, they give up uh, sometimes. So I, yes, I, I, I needed this story to be right. Um, family first and foremost important and, you know, Deborah's family as well. But just, I mean, anybody who was quoted, anybody who um, gave me numbers or whatever, it, it had to be on point. And can I ask how they've responded to the book? Or? Oh, very, I mean, I incredibly um, well. Yeah. Uh, Deborah read it and there were times when she'd call me sobbing. And I mean, just, just because of, you know, like when my, daughter almost dies. And there were things that she, she was like, well, I'm so sorry that I wasn't, um, I wasn't available uh, to you when that happened. And that was the last thing on my mind, you know, or even trying to, to hold her accountable for something. I mean, that's, you know, so that there was nothing there that she had to apologize for. How about your mom? She my, my mother is still, um, my mother has been dealing with some health issues and she's much, much better now. Um, but my mother loves the book. Um, and it was something, as I said, so there was nothing in there surprising uh, for her. And it's difficult. You know, I wanted to be very careful in terms of, um, in terms of the story because she, I lost a sister, but she lost a child. And that is a different dimension of grief. So I just wanted to make sure that that part of the story um, was was something that she was, or anything about my sister, it was something that was was fine with being, you know, revealed. But yeah, yeah. she's she's completely yeah. I mean, I think of writing a, writing a memoir like you've written that's so open and honest and candid for me is just kind of an act of, of courage. I just you know it is. I just it's because you're opening yourself up. Right, and not only you open yourself up to readers, but you're also opening yourself up to all those people around you who you so deeply care about. Right, um, and, and but but true. Alex, I didn't want this, and this is something that my editor um, really worked with me on because I did not want this to be one girl, a story about one girl telling all the business of two right. go, two other girls, mm -hmm. and so I needed to be all in. And so, and I can tell you that maybe in the beginning that I, well, I mean, there were versions of this book where, you know, Dawn was kind of, you know, I was backstage somewhere. Um, but, but really it is a story about three girls. And I also, something that was incredibly, incredibly important is that I did not want to come across as, oh, I, look at my life. I've done everything right. And, and my sister and my best friend, well, they didn't because that is, let, let me say nicely, not true. And that no life is like that. And right. so I wanted to tell, I wanted to be very honest about the places where, you know, I faltered and the places mm -hmm. where um, things didn't work out the way I had expected. And, mm -hmm. and, and just how, but, but I hope that in, in telling this story, that, that it comes across that Black lives, especially Black female lives, are so fragile. Right. And, and it does not... Um, you know, we we grew up in, in, in for for Deborah and Deborah's family as well as as mine. Um, they were not at all wealthy or even middle class, but they were our parents, our families were incredibly resourceful. I mean, they were going to help us if they, you know, if we allowed them to. They were going to band together to help us if we were, you know. So we had a, a safety net, and if we were struggling, um, but. But as I started to think about the story, and for a, a long time, I did have some, some form of survivor's guilt. And so I had to kind of forgive myself. But I also had to forgive Deborah and Kim for making it so darn hard for the people who loved them to save them. 
Right. And that was, I mean, that was kind of the double-edged sword because um, we were this first generation uh, after the civil rights movement. Um, and our parents saw, saw our futures as being incredibly robust. We were going to college, we were going to have great paying jobs, and we were going to become homeowners and partake of every aspect of the American dream. And, and for you know, for my sister and Kim, that dream would prove elusive. And they were the, you know, my first great loves. And I wanted to understand kind of, I mean, not necessarily what happened, but kind of when did we lose them? Uh, mm -hmm. Because they did have the, the support. Right. Well, I'm really glad you brought this up because I'm sure that, that you've got this asked this question all the time, but it feels like such an important one. I'm sure there are people who read the book and think, oh, well, you know, Deborah and Kim just made all the wrong choices. And it's just all a matter of, you know, sort of the personal choices we make. And I know that you must have thought about this a lot as you were putting pen to paper, thinking about this, because we're so quick to talk about personal responsibility and we find it so difficult to talk about collective responsibility. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because you talked, you know, the, you're right. I mean, the lives of, of black women, black men are incredibly fragile in this country and there's not a lot of room for mistakes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that is, um, that is absolutely the, that is absolutely correct. I mean, there, personal responsibility has a place for all of us, but this whole idea of the collective and kind of who gets a second chance and who doesn't, because everybody, everybody will make a mistake in, in his or her life. And, and so that is, um, that happens. I mean, I, when I was growing up, my teachers told me all the time, I mean, from when I was very young that I should go to college. Um, my, my test scores were always really high. I was reading um, at levels off the charts. Um, but the reality is, is that Deborah and Kim were also brilliant. And I don't mean just smart. I mean, just really um, just curious and um, just they, they questioned everything. Uh, but for, for them, teachers focused mostly on their behavior. And they weren't like little um, tyrants in class. My sister um, was incredibly quiet, but she just didn't turn in work when she was supposed to, which, you know, was, was huge uh, that she even thought that that was an option. <laughs> um, but, my, but Deborah, the same thing. I mean, just really, really smart. And so the, and, and they were just, um, they were, you know, for me, rules were scaffolding. For them, rules were things that, that, that you kind of push against. And so what do you, I mean, they are still, there are kids like that who are still kind of uh, outliers that, that teachers and even parents don't always know exactly what to do. Um, but I think that the most, the, the, this whole idea that, I mean, that personality should, that type of personality should not consign you to, you know, to a life that's subpar. So how do we, how do we help kids who kind of, you know, who don't necessarily um, conform or try to, try to follow the rules? But so, yeah, it's super easy to say it's only about choices. Um, I have made some bad choices. I didn't land in the same place. Um, that my sister or my, my, my best friend did. And it's not because I'm a, a perfect person um, or even a, a great person. Um, it's sometimes it's about grace. Sometimes it's about luck. Sometimes it's about timing. You just, you just never know. Uh, but, but yeah, the whole idea of choices, uh, I, I, I end with, um, I used to believe that it was their daring that would lead to their undoing. Um, but it was, it's just so much more complicated than that. And if we give people space, if we try to understand those complications and then try to, as, you know, as a, as a whole, fill in some of those gaps or try to, you know, run interference where we can, then maybe we have more people who survive and who don't completely fall off um, because we all will falter to some degree. Uh, but how do we, you know, how do we save more people than we, we miss? Right, right. No, I'm sure you must have thought about this a lot as you were writing uh, yeah. about this whole question. So I've got to ask as a final question, because uh, I came to care about her so much. How's, how's Deborah doing? Oh, yeah. Deborah is doing fabulously. Um, I am so proud of her. I went to, um, and, I, and I say that I, I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I just mean that I, I just, I mean, she was always incredibly bright. 
Um, and when she, right before leaving prison, a year before she had uh, this reconciliation meeting with her uh, victim's family, the widow and daughter, and they, have, they embraced her during this meeting and they continue to embrace her. She is now um, a member of the board on a foundation that they have for um, an anti-gun anti violence um, foundation. And I mean, they could, so part of her, I believe part of her success today is due um, to the family forgiving her. The, his, his mother, the victim's mother forgave her immediately, but uh, the, his wife and daughter, so that was part of the, um, that, that reconciliation process, that was part, I believe that that's part of her success. She's, um, she's got a strong family as well still, um, but thank you for asking. She's doing oh, yeah, really, really well. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, for the, one of the beauties of the book is you came to care so much about, about the characters. Dawn, this has been such a pleasure. I'm just, uh, I'm, I've been thrilled at the response the book has gotten. It's just been embraced by so many. So uh, I hope it continues to soar. Thank you so much, Alex. It's such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you both so much. This was just great. Um, so thoughtful, so enlightening. I know we could go on for a lot longer, but we want to ask Don some questions that the audience have been um, submitting. And if you have more questions, if you could put them in in the Q&A, then we'll get to uh, see them and hopefully have time. We'll, we'll do as many as we have time for. So, um, First question is, where did Bronzeville get its name? Oh, yes. Um, initially, it was called, um, it called the Black Belt. And then there was a, a, a contest, um, I believe, around the 1930s. And the contest, um, it was a beauty contest. And, and they, because the word Black at that time was used as a pejorative, they wanted to, the, the residents wanted to have a color that was um, that that would elevate who they were, and so they they came up with the idea of bronze, um, and then Bronzeville being the name of the neighborhood. Huh. That makes sense. Thank you. Muted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, there we go. Thank sorry. you. What are some things from your girlhood? that you learned thanks to that lovely friendship with Kim and Deborah that you took with you into your adult life? Oh, um, the, the whole idea of sisterhood, whether it's with blood relatives or not, um, the women that, the, the relationships that women form, especially when, um, when they're new and beginning, I mean, they're so affecting. And, and I have um, girlfriends who are like sisters, I, I say that I, I lost my sister, my only sibling, and, and that was incredibly devastating. Um, but I gained so many um, friendships and um, so many sisters that, that it, it, it really does, um, uh, it, it, it makes for a full life to have those relationships with, with women. Good. Um, what was your timeline in writing the book? And we wondered if it corresponded to any particular Chicago or national events going on. Um, no, it didn't. We were, um, the, I, we sold the book in 2018. Um, and then I blew through some deadlines <laughs> and, 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 and so and then after, so there wasn't any timeline in, time, timeline in terms of the release of the book. Um, that it was, we, I finished it in 2021, um, no, it was 2020, at the end of 2020. And then it takes about a year for, um, I mean, to, to birth a book. And, and so we um, chose the fall of 2021 for its release. Can you talk a little, you, I know you've talked about being a journalist and this is a, being a memoirist, but can you talk a little bit about the similarities and differences between the two and how that informed the process of your writing? And did any of your experience as a journalist help you in writing the memoir? Oh God, um, yeah, that's a great question because I, I mean, 
I am so grateful uh, that, that I have worked in journalism because um, it gives you this, you, I, I know how to put, to put a story together, but I also know that when it's not coming together, um, it's because there's something that's missing. There's something, there's an interview I haven't conducted. There's some research that I haven't, um, that I haven't been able to thumb through. And, and so that's incredibly helpful when you're writing probably any type of book, but with a memoir, it's so deeply personal that you don't get everything from outside of, of you. So um, a, a lot of it comes from just the memories that you have that you're able to then expand on by going to interview somebody else to, to kind of say, well, remember when, or did this happen or did that happen? And can you, can you fill in some blanks for me? So it's the, the, the definitely the, the questions that are asked. Um, and, and I know that that's really the, the basis of any story, just making sure that I, continue, that I ask question after question. And I had so many, um, I had uh, my whole dining room was full of documents. And um, by the time I was in the middle of this, and I, I took a video uh, when I, I was able to clear everything out because I couldn't, I couldn't really imagine just how much, or I, it was just astounding to, to me how much um, material I had amassed for this project. Okay. Um, the book gives a, very clear depiction of the community's failures in all of your lives. And we wondered what gives you hope and how important is hope in your own life now? Um, in terms of the community's failures uh, in our lives, I, I would say that our families were so incredibly supportive that whatever you you know, if there was something um, that was amiss somewhere or de deficient somewhere, that our families were able to to work to um, you know to, to to fix that. But I mean, I think that right now the pandemic has really laid bare. I mean, we talk about the statistics and the communities that have been so uh, affected by it, but we don't talk about enough about how. To, to fix the um, to fix the disparities and and the difference between communities that are well resourced and communities that that aren't you know we talk um, there you hear a lot about oh I can't wait until the end of the pandemic well I mean that you, you, you know that's great if you live in a place where you can walk to the theater or you can walk to a, a grocery store that's well stocked but if you live in a community where you know, you, you, you don't have um, these places, I mean, the, the essentials, then I think it's, it's much more, you know, what does, you know, what is normal? And that becomes a, a, a much more complicated conceit. Thank you. Sure. Our, our book club in Walmart is really enjoying this book, says one of our audience members. Now that your book is out there, is there anything you wish you would have shared that you didn't or that you wished you could have written differently? Um, that's a great question because the paperback is coming out in June. And, and sometimes for the paperback, you have an opportunity to revisit some things. And I didn't change anything. And I am really a stickler about, you know, can I change this? I mean, I was probably awful during the, <laughs> during the production process um, with this book because there was a word here that I wanted to change or maybe a paragraph or to make some something clear. And I don't, I, I just, I didn't change anything. And so I, I am on to the next book, um, but I don't think that I would, I mean, I haven't changed anything. And so I can't, I can't see anything that I, that I would have changed. Okay. Um. Can you tell us a little bit about the scholarship that you started at um, U of I? I know you named it for yourself and for your sister. And um, anyway, we'd like to hear a little about it. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much for asking. Um, yeah. Uh, it, is, it is so important for me to give back. And 
it is also so important for me to tell stories um, about people who are often dismissed and ignored and, and people who are often um, just so misunderstood. And one of the things that I wanted to do with the scholarship was to help support budding journalists um, for whom that is also something that's important. And, and, and so th that is, I think that is the, the basis. Um, people who can go into communities and, and, and just and work against the stereotypes. Um, and I'm not saying that there, there's no truth to stereotypes. I mean, there are truth, I mean, that, that happens um, in many different places. But people who are willing to go in and, and show us and tell us and explain and give us context and nuance, and all of that is so incredibly important um, with, with our stories, especially today, because there is such this huge divide, not just the political divide, but a divide in, in which we, we see each other and how we define who's the enemy or who's the person who is, um, who is you know, extracting the resources. Um, who, so, so I think that we need to have um, stories, news articles that 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 give us um, that 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 widens the aperture and and shows us a more complete story and tells the, you know people who can tell um, tell stories that are interesting, dynamic, and um, incredibly complicated and make people think. That is so important. So that's what I want to support. Dawn, can you tell us? Are there any film adaptations in the works about for this book? Yes, but that's all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, well, we'll look forward to hearing more. Yeah. That's a good answer. Um, several people have asked what your, um, what writers have influenced you. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I, if I can do this, Alex Kotlowitz. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are many, and I have so many books on my, my desk. Um, I love Isabel Wilkerson. Um, she's a huge fan. And um, Jasmine Ward, uh, I'm sorry, she's, I'm, I'm a huge fan of hers. <laughs> uh, Jasmine Ward is amazing. Toni Morrison. Um, I, I hope that's, how's that for a few? Um, yeah, that is I'm just looking great. around my desk. Uh, yeah. Just uh, um, Tina McElroy Ansa. Uh, just the, there are a lot of authors um, who are who are incredible storytellers because I think that at the at the heart we have to be able to tell a story. And then you know the the icing on the cake, or I mean the, the cake itself is what is the I mean how why is the story meaningful? What can I learn? What can the reader learn? How do we grow? Um, you know, when you, we read these books, they're, you know, they're sizable and they require a commitment. And that's why I'm so grateful when I talk to people who have read my book um, that because there's so many other things that they can be doing. Uh, I, I read so many books a year, but not everybody, you know, nobody reads like that. Not everybody reads the way I read. And, um, and I also have to say, and this, I mean this sincerely because I, you guys know I, I write about this, but libraries, oh my God. What you guys do and what you offer, I literally grew up in a library, um, the, my neighborhood library, and Mrs. Grady, I will never forget her name, because I would come in and she, she, she would have books for me, books ready for me to read, because she knew um, what I like to read. And, and, and so that is, um, that is something that I think is, is just so important that we we continue that we read, we read stories that are meaningful and, and that we read writers who, um, who kind of have that as their, their mission. Well, and I do want to read, I'm, I'm sorry, I want to um, just make sure that I, I want my, I told you my editor is also a writer um, and her book, uh, We Are Not Like Them, she is the co-author, uh, Christine Pride. That's another, if I can just give a little shout out there. Love the shout outs to the authors and love the shout outs to libraries too, of course. So that's great. So while we know you cannot tell us much about whether there's a film adaptation, can you tell us if you're working on anything else? Yes, yes I just, um, 
I have, I'm a hundred pages into a novel. Uh, so I'm going back to the other side <laughs> where um, this, you know, just going back to fiction for a while. So a hundred pages into a novel that I absolutely love. And I have never um, before, I've written two other novels, but I have never known the beginning, middle and end. And that does not make any book easy, but it does make it a bit easier. And so I'm incredibly excited about that. Great. We'll be excited. Well, I'll look forward to it. Thank you. Amy, we have one time for one more, two more. What do you All think? All right. Um, sure. Um, someone asked if you have any special writing rituals that you, that you like to do. Oh my God. Absolutely. I, I, you have to, I believe, I mean, writing is a discipline. And in the same way that you exercise every day or whatever it is you do every day, you have to write every day. And so I write every day. Sometimes it's not very good writing, <laughs> but sometimes you have to write the not so good stuff um, in order to get to the stuff that's better. And that's, um, and so I get up in the morning and I come right to my desk. And, and if I don't do that, then my day is a little off kilter. I also know that the morning is when I'm most effective and by about noon or one o'clock, it's time to do, I can do something else in the service of writing, but in, to, to, the idea of um, creating cogent sentences <laughs> may not be, um, that's not the time for that. But so I think that it's important to kind of know when your writing is at its optimum um, and, and, but just to, to write every day. And, and also to, to realize, and I know that people say this, but writing is in the editing, but you have to write something down um, in order to edit it. And so it, you have to go over it. Go, I can't, I look at um, Three Girls from Bronzeville and I am still amazed that it is done um, because I, I, I had so much material and there were times when it felt so daunting that I just thought, okay, I don't know who said I could write a book, um, but it's, but that there is that it, it does feel like a miracle has happened when you have pages and pages, but it does happen as long as you keep doing it. How long did it take you from the time you first came up with the idea or when you first started writing three girls from Brownsville until you, your final edits were in? Um, probably 10 years because I started one iteration, but I was working full time at the time at the Tribune. And that, and so it, I could easily go months and months without writing um, on, on the book, but I kind of didn't know where it, where it was going. I got lost in it, um, in the story, in the writing several times. Um, when I did finally have an editor, I mean, that was almost, that was like having someone who was, you know, in the car with you and helping you <laughs> along that journey. And that was incredibly helpful. But, you know, you have to write whether you have an editor or not, um, because you have to get to that point. Okay, I think our last question is, while your book uh, includes a lot of joy. It also lives, gives clear depictions of difficulties and failures in the community. How important is hope in your life and what gives you hope? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know that I could get up and get out of the bed every day without hope um, and without being this, you know, journalists and we tend not to be all that optimistic from time to time but you have to be you have to maintain maintain the um the energy uh that that we use to pursue the stories um the the hope that your story that the words make a difference and we have a historical record that show that 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 words and telling the stories of people um that they that it can change lives and so I'm incredibly hopeful. I'm realistic <laughs> and I know that it takes a lot of work and we have a long way, we have a long road ahead of us. But, um, but, but even though, you know, all of our lives we have tragedy and we have to get, you know, we, 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 we work very hard to get beyond that. Um, but um, it's for me, I have not lost hope, will not. Well, I think that is a that is a uh, a bright note to end on. Unfortunately, our time is up. Dawn, many many thanks for gifting us not only with this beautiful memoir, 
but also for your time tonight. This has been such an inspiring evening. I'm sure all of our viewers, members of our community will agree, and we are just so honored to have had you here with us. Many thanks again to Alex Kotlowitz for leading such an engaging conversation. We're uh, delighted that, that you were here as well. Also, many thanks to the Friends of the Wilmot Public Library for their support of this year's One Book Program. And of course, thanks to those of you who have joined us tonight. Please note that a link to the recording of tonight's event will be available soon on the library's website in case you would like to rewatch it or share the program with others who were not able to attend tonight. With that, we wish you a wonderful rest of your evening. Stay safe and good night. Thank you so much.